We go about celebrating heritage brands we love, leaning on dependable brands we adore, and exploring even the novel ones that draw us in. Recently, we've had to slow down, be more mindful, and be more careful. Following protocols called for by the Times, our habits follow suit, and so have the stores from the SSI Group. The precautions they take in stores have become the new way of taking care of guests and shoppers. The store's frontliners take every precaution necessary to make our new reality still premium, still beautiful, still hopeful, but also ultimately safer. In the times that we need to maintain more distance and remain safely in our homes, our favorite SSI Group brands commit to remain accessible too. With a specialist at home concierge service, a dedicated shopper can provide hassle free access to your beloved brands. Simply make your selection, place your order, wait for your delivery. For the SSI Group, there is no missing out on the best, even in our different world. Instead, it stresses shopping access and satisfaction across different available channels, whatever channel you're comfortable with and ready for. If, however, you'd rather pick out your online finds yourself, you may browse through the soon-to-launch trunk.ph. The SSI Group also allows us to connect with our community, highlighting the need to give back through its We Rise Together program. They even go a step further by partnering with banks to provide its customers a way to give back. The SSI Group does what they do best. They deliver luxury and quality products and cater to the new wants and new needs of our new lifestyle. All while being an integral part of a helpful, hopeful, and thriving community. Buongiorno a tutti! Siamo in classe A1B e siamo gli angeli di Sor Jane. Ciao, sono Marie. Ciao, sono Marion. Ciao, sono Michelle. Ciao, sono Ria. Ciao, sono Stephanie. Ciao, sono Jules. E sono James, o Giacomo, il presidente della classe. Siamo qui per imparare la lingua italiana. Siamo felici di imparare con nostra bella e super insegnante. Grazie mille. Siamo contenti e felici. Andiamo tutti. Ma che dice? Venite alla scuola Philippine Italian Association. Siamo fortunati. Buono! Baci, baci! Ciao! Ciao. Sono Maria! Sono Maria Lourdes! Ciao ragazzi, mi chiamo Verity! Sono Belle, la presidentessa di classe A2A. Studio! 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 Studio!
aprendió la lengua italiana porque mi marido es italiano. Así, puedo hablar con lui y la su familia y su amigo. Y sobre todo, amo la Italia. Estudio el italiano porque es interesante. Quiero capire mucho durante las conversaciones. Ho deciso di studiare la lingua italiana per comunicare meglio con la famiglia e gli amici di mio marito. Mi sono appena trasferita qui in Italia per vivere con mio marito, il mio cameraman. Perché il mio fidanzato è italiano. Nel futuro io voglio parlare alla sua famiglia e ai suoi amici doventemente usando il loro linguaggio. Imparare l'italiano è molto molto difficile, ma divertente perché i miei compagni di classe sono simpatici e ci aiutiamo tanto tra di noi. La classe è molto divertente, specialmente perché non solo impariamo l'italiano, ma anche e soprattutto le abitudini gli aneddoti di vita reale degli italiani. Le lezioni sono molto difficili, davvero, ma divertenti, perché faccio amicizia con i miei compagni di classe. È divertente perché il supporto viene da Pia stesso, il professore e soprattutto dalle mie compagne di classe che sono diventate le mie sorelle. Le lezioni di italiano con Pia sono molto divertenti. Non è solo uno studio della lingua, ma anche della cultura. Ti voglio bene. Molto bene. Ma che stai dicendo? Mamma mia. Boh, chi se ne frega. Che bello. Delicioso. Ma perché? Buonissimo! Perfetto! Ci vediamo! Ci vediamo.
Ciao, buon pomeriggio. Mi chiamo Sofia Jacinto. Ciao a tutti, mi chiamo Matteo. Il gatto. The teacher who teaches me is teacher Jen. Teacher Jen is a very good teacher in Italian. She teaches me and my classmates a lot of Italian words. I take Italian class taught by Sister Jane, who is a very nice and wonderful teacher who works very hard and always helps me with my pronunciation on difficult Italian words. I can now speak more Italian than before. My favorite Italian expression is ciao. If you want to learn Italian, study with the PS. I had a very good time and recommended this Italian class to my family members and my aunt. Come and roll now to Pian's Language School. Ciao! See you there! Bye! Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin the program. Please allow us a few more minutes to wait for additional guests and attendees. We shall commence the lecture recital by Dr. Sonika shortly. Thank you. I see we have 73 participants already. So we are only, we have a maximum of 100 participants for tonight. And there are many more people who are wanting to get, uh, uh, to get the link, but our limit for tonight was only 100. So if you're here present tonight, then you're one of the lucky people who are seeing this debut of this lecture recital by Dr. Sunifo. So it's 6.30 and I would like to greet everybody. Buonasera, good evening, everyone. Signore, signora, signore, signori. Thank you for joining us today for this amazing event. We have the pleasure of hosting. Well, I'm Dr. Rebecca Singson. I'm an OBGYN and a robotic surgeon. And I'm also the vice president for social affairs of the Philippine Italian Association. And I will be your host for tonight. Our organization has prepared an enjoyable program for everyone. But before we move on, please allow me to acknowledge the presence of the members of the board whom I see among the audience. And 
Amongst them with me today are the PIA Vice President for Culture, Dr. James Frenny, and Maestro Raul Sunico. Now, I'd like to remind everyone that the Philippine Italian Association is also known as the PIA. It is a nonprofit organization which was founded in 1962. Our goal is to promote a closer alliance between the Philippines and Italy, particularly in the fields of culture, language, and the arts. And so we will be fulfilling that goal, one of those goals tonight. Now, throughout its 59 colorful years, the PIA carried out a great number of activities. Its Italian language program was started the year after the birth of the association. The first group courses were followed by one-on-one -on -one tutorials and classes were also given in a number of universities in Manila. Today, the PIA has grown the PIA has a growing language center for Italian and Filipino language. And in keeping with the times, we have even recently launched an e-learning platform for the Italian language. And during this pandemic, we have transferred all our group courses online. During these times, indeed, almost all PIA activities, for that matter, have been transferred online while waiting for better times uh, to meet in person. Uh, we have organized this uh, gathering meanwhile. So to tell you more about tonight's program and to formally welcome you to this event, we would like to call on the new Vice President for Culture at the PIA, no other than Mr. James Frenny. Take the virtual floor, James. Hello to all members, friends, and future members of the Philippine Italian Association. My name is James Franey, and I am Vice President for Cultural Affairs of the PIA here in Manila. As you may well be aware, over the past year, and on account of difficulties related to the COVID situation, the Philippine Italian Association has undertaken to remain in contact with our members through a series of activities which we have arranged through the use of online means. As such, over an extended period, we have made a number of presentations. We have participated in a number of events and we have kept our activities on the forefront for the benefit of all. Some of these have been, for example, anniversary of the arrival of uh, Ferdinand Magellan and Antonio Pigafetta here in the Philippines. As we all know, Pigafetta was the man who wrote the chronicle of the voyage of Magellan to the Philippines in uh, around 1521. In 1981, the PIA placed a statue of Pigafetta in Cebu, just outside of Fort San Pedro, uh, and it was a statue that was recently uh, restored. We also, for example, uh, conducted a presentation uh, on a film about Dante Alighieri. As you know, Dante was the author of the famous Divina Commedia, the Divine Comedy, and the film was presented. A webinar was also presented with the National Library of the Philippines and professors from both Ateneo and the University of Asia Pacific. We also had uh, an event which was called Movie Mov, which was a series of Italian films uh, that were presented. A special session was dedicated to Pinocchio. As you all know, it was the famous uh, wooden child who in, at the end of the story becomes a human being. And then of course we had the European Film, uh, European Philippine Film Festival, which was conducted in Italy and presented a number of classic and contemporary films from the Philippines. Today, what we wish to uh, present to you is a piano recital uh, by Dr. Raul Sunico, who is a true maestro as a pianist, a composer, and a music historian. As many of you may know, Dr. Sunico began his studies in Manila and graduated from the University of the Philippines. He continued his studies at the famous Juilliard School of Music in New York. He then obtained his doctorate at the New York University. Dr. Sunico is a valued member of the board of the Philippine Association and has offered to make this presentation which will cover a period which spans from the Renaissance up to the modern times. 
through the music of the likes of Sgambati, Scarlatti, Respighi, Mascagni, and others. Dr. Sunico shall also cover a historical perspective of the period, as well as the significance of the respective pieces we shall be hearing, how music has evolved, how it communicates with us, how it stirs our senses, and how does it make us think. Going forward in the course of the year, the Philippine Italian Association shall present in the course of the next few months, at least, a series of presentations. One will be on Rafael Losancio. Together with Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, as you may know, uh, Raffaello was one of the great masters of the paintings of the Renaissance. We will also conduct a, a silent film festival. This year is the 15th anniversary of this edition, and we are working to have it presented at the newly reopened Metropolitan Theater. Then we will planning to have a series of interesting readings on uh, Dante's Divina Commedia. It must be remembered that Dante is considered as one of the first who gave credence to the Italian language. Today, as we said, we shall be listening to Maestro Raul Sonico as he shall narrate the history of Italian music and shall perform some of the most significant pieces of the times up to, the including, up to and including the modern music, for example, of Ennio Morricone, who is a composer of the music of some of the best Italian movies of all time. So now sit back, relax, and enjoy the, the talented Dr. Sonico. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. You know, for those of you who have just met James for the first time, he's really one of the one of the uh, gems of the PEI. He's he is a fountain of cultural knowledge, and you will see him over and over if you continue to join our activities because uh, he will be he has conducted and will continue to conduct lectures about the masters in painting. So um, before we go on, I would like to acknowledge the presence of no less than the president of the Philippine Italian Association. We have uh, Ms. Neri Tantojo in the virtual audience. Welcome, Ms. Neri. And of course, we will be moving forward to the most weighted part of the program. Um, and I would like to let all of you know that we will be allotting a few minutes at the end of the lecture recital to entertain your questions with regards to uh, the lecture of Maestro or regarding PIA or regarding this event. So if you have any inquiries, please do not hesitate to type them into the chat box and we will address them at the end of the recital. Now, we are very happy to have received such positive response from the registrations from, for tonight's event. In fact, um, I'm pretty sure we could have, uh, if you opened it to more people, I'm sure we could get, uh, easily gather uh, an audience of a thousand or more. And while it is not <laughs> advisable to gather many people in one venue, at least this online format is a great opportunity for us to continue sharing the rich history of Italy through music. And there's really no better person to have in our midst for this specific person other than a world-renowned award-winning pianist and the maestro behind the lecture recital of this evening, Dr. Raul Sunico himself. Raul Sunico obtained his degree, degrees in not only music, this guy is a genius. He also, also obtained his degrees in mathematics and statistics from the University of the Philippines, my alma mater. He went on to finish his master of music degree from no less than the Juilliard School of Music in New York. His PhD in piano performance from the New York University. And he is also a doctor of humanities degree uh, honoris, uh, honoris Causa from the Far Eastern University. In an international piano competition, he is also an international piano competition award in Italy and the United States and has performed in more than 25 countries representing North America, Europe, Asia, Australia, and many others. Dr. Sunico received the TOYM Award, the 10 Outstanding, uh, 10 Outstanding Young Men Award for Music, the Pamana Presidential Award for Outstanding Overseas Filipino, 
the University of the Philippines Alumni Award, the Aliw Award, and the Awit Award. I think he has reached the epitome of uh, what a musician can ever achieve in this country. And he has served as the president of the um, Cultural Center of the Philippines from 2010 to 2017, and the dean of the University of Santo Tomas Conservatory of Music from 2002 to 2016. He is currently the dean of the St. Paul College of Music and the Performing Arts in Manila and the chair of its Doctoral of Music Arts program. And he continues to be a faculty member at the UST. So without further ado, may I please invite everyone to, play, to pay close attention to your screens. Ladies and gentlemen of the Philippine Italian Association, we present to you the music of Italy through the centuries with Dr. Raul Sunico. Buongiorno. Good day to everyone. On behalf of the Philippine Italian Association, I would like to welcome you to this lecture recital on the music of Italy through the ages. Through this session, we shall attempt to have a general overview of the vastness and richness of this musical resource of a great nation. With its impressive array of composers, musicians, and artists who have lived to a colorful, if turbulent, period of musical history. We hope that even this tiny bit of knowledge that we can obtain here will enhance our appreciation of Italian music and musicians whose invaluable contribution have helped shape the world of music. The influence of Italy on the development of music is encompassing, to say the least. Throughout the centuries, so many Italian names have dotted the musical scene, either as composers, performers, teachers, publishers, religious leaders, royalty and nobility, even politicians. Mention some special people such as Palestrina, Vivaldi, Scarlatti, Verdi, Puccini, Caruso, Pavarotti, and modern-day luminaries Bocelli and Morricone. Aside from this, Italy has been the source of musical inventions such as musical notation, musical instruments, including the piano and violin, as well as opera and theater. Looking at the roster of Italian names that have dotted the musical scene throughout the ages from the medieval period to the present day, one cannot help but marvel at the prolific supply of artists and creators of this most noble art form. The history of Italian music had started as early as the ancient times when Rome was still the center of civilization and to this day remains a part of the Republic of Italy. In 230 AD, well before Christianity was legalized, Rome saw the apostolic tradition of Hippolytes attesting the singing of psalms with refrains from the Alleluia. In 386, St. Ambrose composed sets of hymns which have survived the popularity of the later Gregorian chants. Other notable events in the early centuries include the responsorial singing of the gradual and passions initiated by Pope Celestine I in 425 and the weekly order of monastic psalmody by St. Benedict in 530. During the medieval period that lasted from 500 to 1450 AD, the earliest extant music came to be known as plain chant, which developed into and became synonymous with Gregorian chant. This was a monophonic unaccompanied singing by Roman Catholic monks that flourished between the 7th and 12th centuries. During this time, music was not written, but only learned by rote, which involved numerous repetitions from those teaching them, leading to expected inaccuracies 
arising from faulty transmissions. Although he did not compose the Gregorian chants, Pope Gregory the Great, who lived from 540 to 604 AD, was credited with compiling the chants from the various monasteries throughout the Western world, including Ireland, Spain, and France, some of which have remained anonymous. Born into a wealthy family, where he also became prefect of Rome before he assumed the papacy in 590 AD, Pope Gregory had exerted extraordinary efforts in standardizing the plain chant towards raising the Roman worship of his day. This type of liturgical chant in the Catholic masses attracted a large following among the neighboring countries as well and had supplanted all other existing chants except the Ambrosian chant that has survived to this day. A major development in the transmission of chant occurred when Guido of Arezzo invented the new system of notation. Before this invention, a primitive system of writing notes was started in the form of neumes that became the precursor of the present-day notation. Note shapes, the number of lines in the staff, and rhythmic symbols were different and somewhat limited but managed to improve on the road system of reading and memory. In his book entitled Micrologus in 1020 AD, Guido extended the musical staff from two to five lines, solmization or the presence of sofa syllables, and the Guidonian hand. It was used in the absence of written notation by assigning the various folds of the hand with individual notes. Guido assigned various syllables, called so fa syllables, to label the notes of the scale as Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti. The origin of the so fa syllables was a verse from the hymn to St. John the Baptist that read as Ut quaint laxis, resonare fibris, mira gestorum, famuli ruorum, Solve Puluti, Labi Reatum, Sancte Johannes, where the first syllable of each line represented the sofa syllables, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, while the Do is replaced by Ut, and the C represented by SJ, standing for Sancte Johannes. This is translated as follows, so that your servants may with loosened voices, resound the wonders of your deeds. Clean the guilt from our stained lips, O Saint John. The music during the medieval period was centered in Italy and concentrated almost solely on church and sacred music. The small proportion of non-religious or secular music during this time was provided mostly by the traveling minstrels. They were known as troubadours and trouvers, mostly based in France, dealing with old Occitan lyric poetry with corresponding vernacular groups in Germany known as Meister singers and Mine singers. Although regarded as amateur entertainers, they sang, acted, and played music that appealed to the villagers and urban people alike and even involved some members of the nobility as members, including the Duke of Aquitaine. Accompanied mainly by lutes, they chose such subjects as chivalry and courtly love. Their popularity continued through the 13th century, but started to decline in the 14th century, whenceforth the movement died out before the plague of the Black Death. Che mi donten las claus. As the northern chant traditions were starting to displace the Italian tradition, the French troubadours set out into Italy and formed their own group of secular singing called troubatori. Foremost among them was the blind composer Francesco Landini, whose famous cadence C A B C or Do, La, Ti, Do, became a popular 
ng positional device. Aside from the music of the troubadours and their counterparts, other secular music types that pervaded the music scene were the frotola, a popular homophonic secular song, meaning a solo melody accompanied by an instrument during the 15th and 16th centuries for three to four people, with the uppermost voice carrying the main melody in a typical ABBA format. Major composers were Marchetto Cara and Bartolomeo Tromboncino. The Fratola was the precursor to the Madrigal, popular from the 14th to the 16th century, whose poetic texts were set to melodic danceable rhythms in polyphonic style, where several voices sang in various intervals of each other in interweaving fashion. Its growing popularity extended from its origins in Rome and Florence to the major venues in Venice, then the cultural capital of Italy. The end of the medieval period, around 1500, paved the way for the golden age of the Renaissance, known for its emphasis on personal expression and sophistication, where the element of humanism was brought out. This meant that man was perceived as an independent thinking individual with his own emotion, away from the influence of the supernatural the monarchial and impersonal themes. Moreover, this ushered in the age of the printing press, where the Venetian printer Ottaviano Petrucci, from 1466 to 1539, invented the machine that enabled printed music to be disseminated to a wider audience of composers and performers. Though he was not the first printer, he was the first to print in quantity and the first to print polyphonic music. His publication, Harmonice Musices Od Hecaton, in 1501, was a collection of chansons. Over the course of the next eight years, from 1501 to 1509, he had his most productive output of three volumes of chansons, 16 books of masses, five books of motets, 11 anthologies of rotole, and six volumes of music for lute. The foremost musical figure of the Renaissance period was Giovanni Pierluigi de Palestrina from 1525 to 1594. He was born in his hometown of Palestrina in Rome, which is how his name is remembered as such. Since no Italian had yet developed the compositional skill of polyphonic music, or music for several interweaving voices of equal importance with similar melodic patterns at delayed intervals, Palestina came under the early influence of the more prominent European composers Guillaume Dufay and Yuskan Depré. Eventually, he became a prolific composer mainly of sacred music, with hundreds of compositions to his credit that include 105 masses, 68 of her Tories, 140 madrigals, and more than 300 motets. He is remembered though for his Missa Pape Marcelli, or the Pope Marcellus Mass. When the Catholic Church convened a synod known as the Council of Trent, owing to the concern of the Reformation movement where the church activists advocating for major reforms led by the German Martin Luther bolted the church and started the Protestant denomination, it also sought to exert its influence on the music being performed in the liturgy. To avert a substantial ban on liturgical polyphonic music, Palestrina composed a mass for Pope Marcellus that contained a smoother and consonant type of polyphony 
where any kind of dissonance was relegated to weak beats and lasted only briefly. Although the musical theorists of the present day discounted Palestrina's direct hand in averting the ban on polyphonic liturgical music, he had somehow influenced the Council's leaning toward a somber but dignified sacred music. Here, the text did not obliterate the music in keeping with the religious character of the liturgy, as faithfully observed by Palestrina. Other major figures of the Renaissance period along Palestrina included Orlando di Lasso, renowned composer of polyphonic secular music such as Italian madrigals, villanellas, French chanson, German leader, alongside a good number of sacred music, including motets and passion settings. Giovanni Gabrielli, inspired by the San Marco Church in Venice, was known for his antiphonal music, where two sets of choirs from the left and right sides of the church answered each other in a call and response fashion. Luca Marenzio, foremost madrigal composer, with more than 20 books and 500 madrigals to his name, adopted an eclectic approach in tone and style where he used text painting inspired by Dante and Petrarch to bring the texts to life with elements of dance, rhythm, and lighter thematic subjects. Bartolomeo Tromboncino composed 176 Frotole, where his texts were sourced from Petrarch and Sanazzaro while opting for a diverse style and great emphasis on polyphony. Marchetto Cara was a singer and lutenist who composed spirited and catchy frottole, while Lodovico Agostini composed everyday style and sometimes avant-garde arrangements of madrigals that contained puzzles and riddles which challenged the listeners and kept them awake. Italy experienced a slow musical development in the 15th century when the northern-based Medici and De Este families built up political, powerful dynasties and brought the northern composers of the Franco-Flemish school into their courts. During this time, the prevalent music were mostly light courtly songs called frottole composed for the Mantuan court of Isabella de Este, while the Medici family supported the Florentine Mardi Gras season with the creation of witty carnival songs known as Canti Carnacialeschi. A reawakening of sorts ensued with the birth of Claudio Monteverdi, who lived from 1567 to 1643, who was born in Cremona and is regarded as the transition composer from the Renaissance to the Baroque periods. He combined the heritage of the Renaissance polyphony with the new basso continuo of the Baroque period. Although he initially embraced the polyphonic style of writing in his famous book of madrigals, Nine in All, he gradually shifted to a monodic style of writing in the later volumes, which referred to a type of singing with instrumental accompaniment in contrast to unaccompanied polyphonic singing. Monteverdi's madrigals were secular polyphonic pieces ranging from four to eight interweaving voices, mainly dealing with the earthly themes of love, nature, and poetry. He also composed church music, where his masses became the models for the more famous and grandiose St. Matthew's Passion of Johann Sebastian Bach, and the Messiah of George Frederick Handel. He is best remembered for his L'Orfeo, one of the earliest operas ever written. The actual first opera, Daphne, in 1597, was by another Italian, Jacopo Peri, who lived from 1561 to 1633. But his earliest to survive to this day was Eurydice in 1600. Although Monteverdi's reputation was widely acknowledged, he was not without controversy. Owing to his so-called innovative approach in his style of writing, in the use of harmony and modes that resulted in clear melodies, dramatic power, and lively orchestration. 
While he wanted to respond to his critics to defend his position, his huge popularity had already vindicated him. Sadly, much of his musical output was lost, although some of his significant compositions like the Book of Madrigals have been retained for use by the various choirs around the world. In the 16th century, major strides had taken place that would lead to further progress in the musical world. While Ottaviano Petrucci published the earliest book of keyboard music in Italy, musical instruments were being invented and propagated. Included was the famous violin brand Amati that started its production in Cremona even as Italy became the primary center for harpsichord construction while Lutenist Francesco Canova de Milano was earning for Italy an international reputation for virtuosic musicianship. As music was achieving new heights of cultural respectability, notable publications and events were taking place. Castiglione's The Book of the Courtier espoused musical proficiency as a courtly virtue. Santa Maria di Loreto in Naples was built as the first music conservatory. Adrian Villiers developed music for double chorus at St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice, a tradition of polychoral music that would reach its height in the early Baroque music of Giovanni Gabrielli. Composers like Orlando di Lasso and Cipriano de Rore were experimenting with increased chromaticism which would culminate in the Mannerist music of Carlo Gesualdo, Prince of Venosa. In 1558, Giuseppe Sarlino, the foremost musical theorist of the period, wrote the Institutioni Harmonice, addressing practical issues such as invertible counterpoint. Lighter music was represented by the Villanelle, which originated in the popular songs of Naples and spread throughout Italy. The Renaissance period also saw an increased politicization of the country. In 1559, Antonio Gardano published Musica Nova, whose pro-Republican partisan songs pleased the northern Italian republics but angered the church. The Baroque period saw a tempering of the polyphonic excesses of the Renaissance while introducing its own elaborations, especially in the visual areas of architecture and painting. In music, this was manifested in the various ornaments such as trills, mordents, turns, and other additions to the basic notes to curl them up and provide additional emphasis to the section endings and resolutions. One of its foremost figures was an innovative Italian composer named Antonio Vivaldi, who lived from 1678 to 1741, whose depiction of visual images served as the precursor of the romantic musical form known as program music. Born in Venice, Vivaldi was an established violinist, teacher, and cleric, and is considered as one of the greatest Baroque composers who became famous for his numerous instrumental concertos. Foremost among them was the set of four violin concertos, grouped together as the Four Seasons, that depicted visual imageries as suggested by the note formations. In the Four Seasons, Vivaldi utilized various characters, nature movements such as snowfall and gusty winds, as well as animals, to paint the scenes typical of each of the four seasons of the year. Many of Vivaldi's works were written for the female music and song of Ospedale della Pieta, a home for abandoned children where he used to work for more than 30 years. A greater amount of music was written for the girls who were trained for later music education, while the boys were expected to leave the institution by the time they reached the age of 15. Vivaldi later moved to Vienna after meeting Emperor Charles VI in the hope of preferential treatment, 
But the emperor died soon after his arrival and thwarted the composer's musical ambitions. Vivaldi himself passed away the year after in poverty. Domenico Scarlatti, who lived in 1685 until 1757, was born in Naples in the same year as the great composers Johann Sebastian Bach and George Frederick Handel. He was the sixth of ten children, whose musician father, Alessandro, had also composed in a variety of forms. The younger Scarlatti was famous for his numerous keyboard sonatas, numbering more than 500, which were single movement works in binary form, lasting for only a few minutes each, and were originally written for the harpsichord. They are mainly characterized by their display of harmonic audacity, sudden discords and modulations, and frequent dynamic contrasts. Let us listen to one of these works. Sonata in A major, K429. Aside from the sonatas, he also composed operas, cantatas, and liturgical music. Much of his life was spent in the service of the Portuguese and Spanish royalty, under whose patronage he died in Madrid in 1757. The classical period ushered in an era of form and order. During this time, the music capitals shifted to Austria and Germany, led by the musical giants Franz Joseph Haydn, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and Ludwig van Beethoven. The Italian composers, although relegated to secondary roles during this time, nevertheless exerted their influence on their peers and future composers with their creations that have withstood the test of time. One of these was Muzio Clementi, who lived from 1752 to 1832, noted pianist and composer. He was known for his fluent and technical legato that he had passed on to future composers John Field, Johann Baptist Kramer, Ignaz Moschelis, John Nepomuk Hummel, and Carl Cherry. He had also influenced Beethoven and Chopin. As one of the outstanding pianists of the time, the Holy Roman Emperor Joseph II once pitted him and Mozart in a piano duel where each would perform his own compositions as well as improvise. Fortunately, in a diplomatic decision by the Emperor, he had declared it a tie. Clementi is known for his sonatinas and piano methods, which are a staple repertory of many young pianists. Here now is the sonatina number no. 3 in C major, one of six in his album of sonatinas.
Opera was born in Italy around 1600 and continues to play a dominant role in the development of Italian music, as well as the form of opera itself throughout the world. Two types of opera emerged, the opera seria, or serious opera, and the opera buffa, or comic opera. Opera seria dealt with serious themes, a heavy concentration on solo singing, and at times, a languishing sequence of arias without much action. On the other hand, opera buffa actually started only as an intermission or intermezzo between the typical two acts of the opera seria. Later on, due to its popularity with the audience for its entertaining character, as opposed to the drier and musically heavy plots and singing of the opera seria, opera buffa became an independent entity to become a complete opera form of its own. One of its foremost exponents was Giovanni Battista Pergolesi, who composed La Serva Padrona, or The Maid Turned Mistress a comic plot of a maid into tricking her aging master to marry her. Daphne by Jacopo Peri was the earliest composition considered opera, whose main characteristic was the practice of monody, or solo singing of a dramatically conceived melody that seeks to express the emotional content of its text. Its accompaniment consisted of a relatively simple sequence of chords rather than polyphonic parts. Monteverdi later composed Orfeo, which achieved great acclaim. It was also an introduction to the recitative, or recitar cantando, or speech in song. After Monteverdi, there was a shift to provide more space for arias to be inserted between recitatives to provide a greater emotional interest. Subsequently, 
There were operas that were written in Italian, but by foreign composers, including Handel, Gluck, and Mozart. One of Gluck's famous operas, Orpheus and Eurydice, tells the story of Orpheus and his enchanting lyre music, who, after the untimely demise of his beloved Eurydice, was able to lure the gods to get her back from the underworld. Touched by his music, the gods permit him to take back his beloved on condition that he not look back at her until they reach Earth. Unfortunately, Orpheus becomes skeptical about the gods' intentions since he is not able to feel her presence behind him. And so when he looks back to see whether she is indeed following him, she immediately falls back into the underworld. The opera contains the famous intermezzo, occurring while Orpheus was anxiously waiting for Eurydice. This is transcribed for piano by Italian composer Giovanni Sgambati, who lived from 1841 to 1914. Born in Rome, Sgambati was a composer, conductor, pianist, and teacher. Here now is the piano transcription of Sgambati of the intermezzo scene from the opera Orpheus and Eurydice entitled Melody. Italian opera reached its golden age during the Romantic period with composers such as 
Joaquino Rossini, Gaetano Donizetti, and Vincenzo Bellini, starting the operatic trend during this period. Vincenzo Bellini, from 1801 to 1835, was born in Catania, and he helped establish the tradition of bel canto, or beautiful singing, a vocal trait of the romantic opera that emphasized melody over other musical elements. In his opera Norma of 1831, its most famous aria entitled Casta Diva was initially spurned by the heroine, but after Bellini struck a deal with her that he would revise the score if she still had doubts about the music after practicing it for a week, the soprano eventually changed her mind and attitude. In spite of his short life of 33 years, he was able to create other successful operatic masterpieces that include I Puritani, La Sonambula, Capuletti, and Il Pirata. As a great influencer of the Polish composer Frederick Chopin, the latter's famous nocturne in E-flat, Opus 9, Number 2, which is popularized into To Love Again, was written as an accompaniment to one of Bellini's arias. Joaquino Rossini, who lived from 1792 to 1868, wrote 33 operas in addition to many songs, chamber music, piano works, and sacred music. He became known for his comic operas such as L'Italiani in Algeri, Il Berbere di Sevilla, and La Serentola. It was during Rossini's time that opera buffa or comic opera reached its peak as he was influenced by earlier composers Domenico Cimarosa and Giovanni Paisiello. Many of Rossini's overtures have become mainstay concert pieces with their rhythmic energy and organized madness. Later, however, when the taste of the audience started to shift towards the more serious and dramatic singing, Rossini decided to stop composing and retire altogether. Gaetano Donizetti, who lived from 1797 to 1848, was born in Bergamo. He had composed almost 70 operas, earning his nickname Dozinetti for one dozen because of his great easiness in writing music. A leading composer in the bel canto style, he was better known for his comic operas, such as L'Elysil d'Amore or The Elixir of Love in 1832 that tells the story of a female landowner and a hapless peasant who are joined together by a fake love potion that the latter is made to believe would work in pursuing the landowner. There was also Don Pasquale in 1843. His masterpiece, however, is the immortal Lucia de la Mermur in 1835, a historical drama that tells of a girl who loses her mind when, for political reasons, she is forced to marry someone she did not love. The famous mad scene shows the tremendous demands on the heroine and is clearly the focal point of the opera. The last 50 years was dominated by Giuseppe Verdi, considered the greatest musical icon in Italian history, dominating the scene after Bellini, Donizetti, and Rossini. He was born in the village of Leroncole near Buseto in 1813. His early operas showed signs of sympathy for the Risorgimento movement that sought the unification of Italy, as it espoused universality within the national character and where historical themes could be related to his pan-Italian vision. He also became politically involved by accepting an elective position but only briefly and without much enthusiasm. 
an intensely private person, Verdi did not associate himself with the social organizations, preferring instead to concentrate on his land ownership in his region after his operatic successes. He was an astute negotiator as he paid particular attention to his financial contracts to make sure that he was properly remunerated for his works. His three main developmental periods of operatic works include Nabucco and Luisa Miller in the early period, Rigoletto, Il Trovatore and La Traviata in the middle period, and Otello, Falstaff, and Aida in the final period. Among his productive output, La Traviata became one of the most popular, although it was a failure on opening night because Verdi was not impressed by his singers, further aggravated when the management insisted against Verdi's wishes that the production be in the historical rather than the contemporary setting. This caused the composer to revise the score over the next two years, resulting in its astounding success to this day. Aside from the operas, he also composed a requiem, considered one of the outstanding works of this genre, alongside those of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Hector Berlioz, and Johannes Brahms. Verdi's biographer, John Russell, noted that in spite of the beauty of his requiem, he was not much of a religious believer. However, the projection of hell seemed to rule in this work, which seemed troubled to the end and offering little consolation. Upon his death in 1901, Verdi's immense popularity was clearly demonstrated when his funeral service in Milan with Arturo Toscanini conducting a combined choir and orchestra in some consisting of musicians coming from other parts of Italy was attended by more than 300,000 people, considered as the largest public assembly of any event in the history of Italy. Later in the century saw the culmination of romantic opera in the career of Giacomo Puccini, renowned for his treatment of pure melody in the history of Italian music. His operas included Madame Butterfly, La Boheme, and Turandot, which is famous Nessun Dorma, popularized by Luciano Pavarotti. After Puccini, no other Italian opera gained a permanent place in the operatic repertory. At the height of the Romantic opera period, a stylistic tradition known as Verismo pervaded the preferential themes of the composers, where everyday life and ordinary people became the central themes and protagonists. Away from the earlier subjects of deities, supernatural beings, mythical figures, and royalty. Verdi applied this tradition in depicting the central figures of Aida, Mimi in La Boheme, and Violetta in La Traviata, while Puccini depicted Shosho San in Madame Butterfly as the victim of betrayal. One of the leading exponents of the Verismo tradition was Pietro Mascagni. His opera Cavalleria Rusticana 
exhibits the constant conflicts arising from love and jealousy, where both hero and heroine become victims of their own infidelity. Here is the intermezzo from the opera, interspersed between the church scene and the ensuing duel between the protagonists. The most noteworthy characteristic of Italian music in the 19th century was its predominantly operatic style to the exclusion of most other musical forms. Many of the Italian composers preferred to compose in this genre so that not even a single Italian symphony was composed during this time. Nevertheless, there were some outstanding sacred music that was made including the Stabat Mater and the Petite Misa Solennel by Rossini, as well as the Requiem by Verdi. The golden age of Italian opera during the Romantic era slowly gave way to other operatic traditions in other European countries, particularly the grand operas of German composer Richard Wagner, like the Ring Cycle, Lohengrin, Tristan and Isolde, the nationalistic operas of Russian composer Modest Mussorgsky, 
in Boris Godunov, the French composer Georges Bizet in Carmen, and the Spanish composer Manuel de Falia in The Three-Cornered Hat. In addition, the rise of the Broadway musical provided a popular alternative to the heavier and more profound operatic productions that catered to a wider audience. Outside of the opera, some Italian composers produced vocal and instrumental works with a style parallel to that of their European counterparts. Although far from the reputation that the opera had earlier achieved. Niccolo Paganini, who lived from 1782 to 1840, was a violinist, violist, guitarist, and composer. His fiendishly difficult 24 Caprice for solo violin Opus 1 clearly established his stature as a virtuoso performer and composer and poses one of the greatest technical challenges for many an aspiring concert violinist. This would continue into the 20th century when some composers would initially be influenced by the great masters of the contemporary tradition before venturing to search out for their own style. Ottorino Respighi was a composer who was fond of arranging and orchestrating early music, particularly of ancient Italy and the Renaissance period. He was most famous for his stimulating tone poems evoking a variety of sights and sounds from death to birdsong as depicted in his three compositions dealing with the Roman countryside, the Fountains of Rome, the Pines of Rome, and Roman sketches. His Noturno, or Nocturne, was a composition clearly illustrating the calm and tranquility that a quiet evening can provide. Here, we are left to imagine the moods created by the rich harmonies and persistent descending thirds.
Luciano Berrio, who lived from 1825 to 2003, was a pioneer in electronic music and did a lot of experimental work. Studying with Italian composer Luigi della Piccola, he was also greatly influenced by Russian contemporary composer Igor Stravinsky, especially for serial and electronic techniques. However, his later works explored indeterminacy and the use of spoken texts. His virtuoso works for solo instrument carried the name of Sequenza, Aside from other stage works, he was especially known for adapting and transforming the works of others, as he had done for the ending of Pocini's opera Turandot. He later became the president of the Accademia Nazionale di Santa Cecilia in Rome. Luigi Nono, who lived from 1904 to 1990, was born in Venice, an avant-garde composer who carried the same name of his visual artist grandfather. Born into a wealthy family, he studied with renowned Italian composers Bruno Maderna and Gian Francesco Malipiero as he developed his own contemporary style. He became one of the leaders of new music with contemporary giants Pierre Boulez and Karl Heinz Stockhausen. He was a member of the Italian Communist Party. Here is renowned pianist Maurizio Polini, who was regularly featured Nono's compositions in his recitals, playing Sofote on the Serene or Serene Waves Endured in 1976. Bruno Maderna, who lived from 1920 to 1973, was born in Venice, a conductor and pianist. He wrote in almost all genres, ranging from instruments, chamber, concerto, electronic, transcribed, and incidental music. Included here are his piano concertos, Australum for mezzo-soprano, flute, oboe, and orchestra, and quadrivium for four percussionists and four orchestras. He was fond of creating sounds of trees and background noises. He had been the director of new music in Tanglewood, Massachusetts, and principal conductor of the Orchestra Symphonica of IAI, Milan. Giuseppe Martucci, who lived from 1856 to 1909, was born in Milan a conductor, composer, pianist, and teacher. One of the foremost figures of the 20th century, 
He was influential in reviving Italian interest in non-operatic music. He was recognized by the great Arturo Toscanini himself when the latter conducted his symphonic work. Alfredo Casella, who lived from 1889 to 1947, was born in Turin, was a pianist and composer. His most successful work was the suite from the ballet La Giara. He also composed several symphonies, Rhapsody for Orchestra, and the symphonic piece Italia. A regular international piano competition bears his name. Ennio Morricone, who lived from 1928 until 2020, was a composer, orchestrator, conductor, and trumpet player. With his output of more than 500 music scores for cinema and television, with more than 70 award-winning films, in addition to more than 100 classical works, he has been regarded as one of the most prolific and greatest film composers of all time. His music for films are characterized by their evocative sounds and dreamy, exciting, melodic passages. He had created unusual sounds like male chanting, Spanish guitars, whistling, and bells in A Fistful of Dollars, a film in 1964, and the use of harmonica in Once Upon a Time in the West that sold for more than 10 million copies. His music for The Hateful Eight with director Quentin Tarantino won the Golden Globe and Academy Awards for Best Musical Score. Other film music include Exorcist II, The Holocaust, La Cage of Fall, TV series The Sopranos, Simpsons, and La Piobra, a long-running episode about the Mafia, as well as Carol and A Man Who Became Pope. Morricone also collaborated with big-name film and music personalities like Harrison Ford, Glenn Close, Kirk Douglas, and Yo-Yo Ma, as well as Warren Beatty, Geoffrey Rush, and Donald Sutherland. One of his most loved films, Cinema Paradiso, directed by Giuseppe Tomatore, tells the story of a young boy's friendship with an aging cinema projectionist. Its main theme contains a poignant melody amidst a simple but enchanting harmonic progression. Here is the central theme plus another endearing melody of the movie. It is at once melancholic and inspiring.
Other than the achievements in the compositional styles of the various periods, Italy had also produced its own set of international and renowned performers. These include the singers Luciano Pavarotti, Renata Tebaldi, Franco Corelli, Giuseppe Di Stefano, and Andrea Bocelli, pianists Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli and Maurizio Polini, violinists Ruggiero Ricci, Salvatore Accardo, and Uto Ugi, conductors Arturo Toscanini, Claudio Abado, Piero Gamba, and Riccardo Muti. Moreover, the best instruments today were Italian inventions, including the violin brands Amati, Guarneri, and Stradivari, as well as the piano brand Fazioli, emanating from the time that the instrument was first built around 1709 by Venetian harpsichord maker Bartolomeo Cristofori. Its operatic venues are equally as famous as the featured performers. The oldest opera house in the world, Teatro di San Carlo, was opened in 1737 in Naples, which was then the center of arts in the country and the rest of Europe. It was later followed by the prestigious La Scala in Milan in 1778, now considered as one of the major operatic centers of the world. It is a venue where a singer would say that he or she has arrived after having performed there. This concludes our travelogue into the music history of Italy, spanning almost 2,000 years since the Roman times and covering the church's own development through the papacy amidst various splintering denominations. To say that Italy's history is rich is a gross understatement. The width and breadth of its musical figures and developments are so spread out that it is difficult and almost impossible to just classify them into a few genres. As we progress to the 21st century and its anticipated innovations in the music industry, the Italian counterparts are certainly keeping pace with the rest of the world in discovering and creating new trends while keeping their old tradition of having beautiful, expressive, and inspiring music. What better way to conclude our event on the history of Italian music by partaking of something Italian? Best wishes to the Philippine Italian Association. Saluti! Bravissimo. Dr. Raul Sunico, you have completely outdone yourself. This was a magnificent masterpiece that, that brought us all a sublime experience tonight. I'm so happy that uh, you've shared so much of uh, Italia, Italy's history of music uh, spanning all these uh, centuries. Now, I'm sure... I'm sure there's there are uh, a lot of questions that people would like to ask, and and so we're going to start rolling the questions. Uh, for a start, uh, an Italian Id idiomatic expression says "Paganini doesn't repeat" and means that things are going to be said just once. Uh, do you know the basis for this expression? Okay, well, good evening to everyone. Thank you again for, for the honor of uh, presenting this lecture recital, uh, Rebecca. So in response to the first question, Paganini does not repeat. I think it alludes to a musical improvisation uh, mm -hmm. because Paganini was not only a technical master, but he also improvised. And we can see that the many variations of the, you know, that uh, the theme that was presented earlier, tan parararam, parararam, there, there were several composers who uh, actually used the theme, including Brahms, uh, Liszt, Rachmaninoff, 
So variations, that means you present the theme once and then you repeat, but actually you don't repeat. But because when you uh, try to hopefully repeat the melody, it's in another kind of variation. So that's probably what he means by Paganini does not repeat. You only vary. Wow, awesome. That's really awesome. Hmm. Now, uh, this is from, I believe this is from Ambassador Virgilio. Yes, uh, hello. Oh, uh, Virgil, <laughs> Virgil, my friend. Yes, we have a complete record of Filipino singers and musicians who have performed at Ita Italian venues like La Scala, such as Sopranos, Jovita Fuentes, and Tina Arellano. Thank you for this thorough summary of Italy's rich musical tradition, which has also permeated the Philippines since the first Western contact, like through Magellan and Pigafetta. Yes. So do we have a record of Filipino singers and musicians who performed at La Scala? Well, I am not sure if we have a record. I know that one of the most recent uh, Filipino singers who performed at La Scala uh, was uh, Arthur Espiritu, who was our one of our lead singers for our last opera by the Pia, you know, the uh, Lucia de la Mermoor. Mm, nice. There have not been a lot of Filipino personalities who have performed at La Scala. Yeah. But uh, just like the Olympics, there's always a first time, right? <laughs> I mean, no. when we, we, we finally got gold. gold. <laughs> yes. Where for the La Scala, it will not be a first time, but hopefully we can produce yes. more. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But yeah, you know, after the first one, we've had three. Yeah. So after it's about time. Yes, I hope we can have, we have another one at the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, so um, the Italian music, uh, well, we started this journey through the centuries with the Roman times. Do we have any writing or testimony to the cultivated music that the Romans were playing and listening to? Well, mu much of the early music were recorded by the monks, you know, the medieval monks. Mm, yes, yes. I remember at the time there was no musical notation yet. And even for yes. writing themselves in the alphabet, they had their own alphabet. So much of the early writings and early information uh, originated from the medieval monks, from Pope Gregory, you know. And of course, in the, like I said in my lecture, in the process of transmission, uh, many of those uh, bits of information can be erratic, if not lacking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what we have now are what we got from these sources. Uh, there is mm -hmm. this uh, primary source called the, uh, the uh, Moldenhauer Archives, M-O-L-D-E-N-H-A-U-E-R, Moldenhauer Archives, which contain uh, many writings about particular uh, musical, musical events, not only Italian, but uh, all around the world. So we can get a lot of information from that. Nice. Well, talking about information, well, there is a comment here from Oski Ravanera, and he says, I could not have enjoyed my Wednesday evening than to be here tonight. <laughs> Thank at a time you for the good words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of the pandemic that, that has been full of grief. The grace yeah. of the storytelling by which Maestro Sunico shares his wealth of knowledge is most heartwarming. heartwarming. Bravo, the, Philippine, the board of the Philippine Italian Association. Bravo, Maestro Raul Sunico and team. Bravo, Alessandro Milano and team. I look forward to reviewing this in the YouTube channel of PIA so I can share <laughs> this with friends and family to okay. learn from. So hint, hint, this has to yeah. be posted on YouTube. Yes, well, over over again. But, you know, we, we have to pay the necessary copyright and, you know, all those royalties that are involved oh. when we put on platforms like this, yes. Oh, that's true, no? I was thinking about that, actually. If, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, so. that's always a thought. It, it's possible. We just have to meet the necessary expenses involved in these kinds of uh, dissemination. 
Oh, maybe if we have a generous donor who would make it possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, while you are there, maybe you can already announce. <laughs> calling, yeah. all, calling all donors. <laughs> the aficionados, those who enjoyed tonight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had um, we had a full house, actually. Thank you. So, well, Rebecca, actually, uh, this is uh, this is an opportunity to tell those people who are viewing whether they are PM members or not. So, uh, it, of course, they know this has been offered free, not only for PM members but also for non-members. It's just to uh, let them know about what PIA is doing, even during this pandemic. So, hopefully, they will be uh, attracted later to joining the PIA and its many activities that will that we advertise in the beginning of the show, you know, the language classes, the different activities, the festivals. Hopefully, this will entice them to join us, if not the association, at least join in some of our activities. And we also take this uh, opportunity to announce that Mr. James Frenny, who actually introduced me earlier, will also have his own lecture. Uh, we will be announcing it when we know the details of that lecture. Yes, indeed. Thank you for mentioning that because uh, we do want more members to join our Philippine Italian Association and they can sign up in our Philippine Italian Association.org. That's our website and there's a link to, to become a member. Yes. Um, can we, I think we will still entertain maybe, do we still have time for a few more questions? Maybe two? Um, oh, I have a question. If, if, well, you know, the, um, Maestro, a lot of Filipinos have not even listened to one opera. They have not heard one opera yeah. uh, in their lives. And mm -hmm. if we were to, uh, we, if we were, if we were to roll this out to the masses, what opera do you think you would start with to, build that appreciation of Filipinos for opera? Well, one of the, uh, one of the most popular uh, things that came out of the opera, of course, it's not so cheap to mount that, is the opera Aida by Verdi. Because, uh, well, many Filipinos have, of course, uh, attended school. And during their graduation, maybe they don't realize that the graduation march that they walk, that they walk with, Tam, pam, pam, tarararam. Wait, sorry. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. That's the triumphal uh, march from, from my graduation I march. Sing, I don't think very well, you know. <laughs> I know my limitations. <laughs> I can only play. <laughs> Yeah, so many many of those people who don't realize, I myself, when I graduated from the Ateneo in the elementary school, I marched I marched with that music and I didn't even know where that came from. That's true. So no, that's an actually... introduction for, for people who are not opera enthusiasts. Maybe that will lure them to find out what, where does this scene really come from? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. No? Actually, there's a lot of uh, classical music that has permeated our lives and we don't even know that. Especially oh, yes. the Gaudi's uh, music. Norma, Pavarotti, you yes. know. That. Yeah, everybody knows that. That's true. Well, I think we'll ask this one final question. Um, major musical instruments such as the violin and the piano have been invented in Italy. And as we learned tonight, many of the music innovations also came from Italy. Why do you think Italy is a fountain of music and you know, in musical innovations? What is it? Well, I learned from the, from the history uh, lecture this evening that the origin of music uh, almost came from, of Western music came from almost from Italy alone, you know, yeah. uh, starting with uh, Pope Gregory, you know, the medieval monks, yeah. the Hans, uh, great composers like uh, Palestrina and uh, Monteverdi. And uh, the, the earliest instruments came from Italy, you know, because uh, Bartolomeo Cristofori invented the piano and all the famous violins came from Italy also. I don't know yeah. for what, maybe it's in the pizza. That's why I, that's why I, <laughs> I tried to eat pizza at the end. Hopefully I might become an inventor too someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there must be. It, 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 there must be like something in the Italian food and the pasta. 
<laughs> that triggers that musical genius to come out, huh? Yes. Yeah, but that's what I also thought when I was in Austria, you know, when uh, I said, my goodness, no wonder <laughs> people can compose such beautiful music because of this environment. Yeah, well, the environment um, helps a lot. Same in Italy. The environment helps a lot, really. You know, with the, yeah. with the Renaissance, with, with the Italian masters in painting, you know, they inspire the musicians and the musicians inspire the painters. The artists, they inspire each other. Yeah. True, true. That's true. Beautiful. Well, you know, um, we had a really, really wonderful evening. Thank you so much, uh, Maestro. Um, Thank um, you. you know, Thank you. <laughs> I don't want this night to end, but unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> we're at the end of our show. Well, thank and you. I've been uh, I've been reading the chat box, and uh, as we as we talk now, I've been reading. I've been uh, seeing all these uh, beautiful comments. Thank you for all those people who have. Uh, you know, have signified their pleasure and enjoyment at this lecture. So hopefully, uh, this would have contributed to our appreciation of not only Italian music, but music in general. Okay, And hopefully that we have future things like this also from other people. Yeah, there's, a, there's actually a comment by Norma. Uh, I, I cannot pronounce her family name. Swing <laughs> Adele. <laughs> An absolute pleasure has made music history so interesting inspires us to explore Italian music and composers more. Grazie to the gifted lecturer, um, uh, Maestro Raul Sunico. And how about the program on the Italian opera next? <laughs> well, oh, there are many aspects, <laughs> many aspects that can be uh, written about or can be talked about. We can talk about that in the future meetings of PIA. Why not? There are many things that can be done. Mm. Yeah, and then you intersperse, you know, uh, excerpts of the opera. The most, at least, start with the more renowned ones. You know. One of one of the interesting topics, Roberta, is to uh, to elaborate more on Italian opera. Yeah, yeah, we would yeah, love the, that. The reason why maybe some people felt that uh, it was really too brief to uh, to feature this opera or that is because I I did not have that much time, you know. I have to compress 500 years into one hour in a few minutes. So we, we want to, I just wanted to make sure that almost everything is represented. Okay. Yeah. yeah that, and that was an amazing feat, I must say. I mean, when you were going through it, I said, wow, all the research, knowledge, photos, <laughs> videos, you know, captions. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, that's why I call it a masterpiece by itself. Yeah. I, I want to acknowledge also in relation to that, Mr. Holland Buela, who was my, my uh, videographer and also Mr. Michael Jacinto and his wife Kay for the video editing. Fantastic. We spent, yeah, because uh, sleepless yeah. hours trying to make yeah. whatever we can make for tonight. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In, in fact, you know, it, it gave us a, uh, an advantage over watching you on stage because we were like peeking behind your shoulder and closing yeah. up on your hands, you know. So I thought that was such an advantage that you know we're doing this online and yeah, there is uh, an advantage to doing this online because uh, you don't have to it, you have the advantage of seeing things from different angles it's just like exactly. seeing a tennis match on tv uh -oh. it's much better than well i don't know maybe it's it's still much better to see it in person <laughs> like, but there are some angles that you can see on tv on television much clearer than if you're there in the actual stadium you know yeah, very, very true. Very true. Iba, pero nevertheless, you know, it did not lessen our enjoyment that um, even if this uh, whole experience was virtual, it was still very sublime. And, yeah. you know, you all took us to another level of existence when you, <laughs> when you would play. Fantastic. So... Uh -huh. Maybe at this point, um, well, the Philippine Italian Association would like to uh, express the gratitude, gratitude to all of our guests who took part in tonight's event. And of course, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And please uh, do not uh, fail to become a member of the Philippine Italian Association if you want to experience future cultural events like this. 
We're yes, having sir. one in the in the last quarter with James Frenny talking about Rafael Asancio. So let's uh, maybe we can all turn on our cameras so that we can take uh, a picture of everybody to commemorate this beautiful event tonight. Okay, thank you. Okay. Alessandro, are you taking the picture? Oh, no, it is uh, LexCode. We'll take the Thank picture. you also to Alessandro. Grazie. Alessandro. Yes. He is the man behind the scenes. The man behind the scenes. Just influential in this project. And of course, to Ms. Nedi Tantoco, our president. Our, and Philip yes. Delagalio. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The very active members. Do we have a picture of everybody? Yes, um, so it's going to be four pages. So for the first one first. Okay, one, two, three, smile. Next. Okay. Just keep smiling because you don't know what page you're in. Yeah, one, two, three, smile. Okay, and then next. One, two, three, smile. Okay, now we're done. Hey. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Maestro. Thank you uh, uh, for making this night so memorable. Thank you to and everyone. Thank you for coming, and we hope to see you soon at our next event. So stay safe and healthy, everyone.